a formidable opening batter for South Africa. He took up coaching after retirement, leading India to the number one ranking in tests and the World Cup victory in 2011. Now he runs a cricket academy in his hometown of Cape Town and through the Gary Kirsten Foundation nurtures inclusivity and sporting talent in the country. He's also recently joined as the mentor of the newly minted IPL side Gujarat Titans. Cricketer, coach, motivational speaker, philanthropist. Multi-hatter Gary Kirsten is our guest in this episode. I think that's the holy grail of any environment, isn't it? Where you get people to um, fight for a, a, a common cause or a shared purpose. And um, um, that was certainly... Um, my prior priority when I joined the Indian team was to was to get those group of people. We we use the analogy: um, um, Are you playing for the name on the back of your shirt or on the name on the front of the shirt? You know, and um, we had to shift a number of guys um, who were who were playing for the name on on the back of the shirt, and that was reflected in their behaviours. It was it was very noticeable that their behaviours reflected um, not a common purpose or, or a shared goal. So I think to be able to shift that was the, the priority and obviously it requires um, leaders, both formal and informal, to drive drive that. Um, and I think the team had enough really good people in it um, and some and some senior players who could drive the, that narrative home, um, starting literally from day one and, and Kind of extrapolating that out to you know the end of the world cup where it became an absolute priority every day so it was part of our narrative part of our language on a daily basis on the first day that i arrived um, with the indian team and we had arranged a warm-up session um with the with the sports and, and conditioning coach um, you know, five out of the 15 players in the squad walked out for the training session and I asked the sports and conditioning coach, where are the other players? And he said, no, they warm up on their own. So that would be one example of the behavior that we shifted from that day on. Another example would have been, um, you know, in test match cricket, um, I noticed that the number nine, 10 and 11 batsmen never arrived um, at the nets with their, bat, with their pads to come and practice their batting. And the, and the answer was, well, they're in the team for bowling. So I said, well, what happens if we need you to score for runs for us at, at the end of um, end of a test innings? And they said, oh, well, it's, you know, it's just hit and hope, basically. And I said, no, we're going to change that. So we built, we, we shifted that narrative. And, you know, our low order batsman practiced a lot. I'll never forget that, um, you know, I challenged Habajan Singh, who was batting eight in our team, to say, well, have you got a test hundred yet? And... Um, he hadn't, and I said, "Well, practice like you want to get a Test hundred." And he ended up, he ended up against New Zealand in I think it was 2010, getting two two hundreds in the series. Leadership comes in a lot of different forms, so there's not only one style of leadership that can work. Um, probably the two best. Um, sporting leaders that I've worked with as a coach, one was MS Dhoni and the other one was Graham Smith. And you couldn't have two individuals further apart in their personalities um, and very different leadership styles. Um, you know, Graham Smith was a great orator. He could, he could motivate and move people on the platform. Um, MS Dhoni is very quiet, doesn't, not a big orator. Um, he moves and influences people by his example. I think there's a, a lot of different leadership styles and I think it is a learned behavior. I think you can become a better leader. I think we all have leadership qualities. Um, for me, one of the dangers of leadership is, is to think that you can lead by title or you can lead by um, competence, um, career competence. You know, um, I, I am the most qualified accountant in the group, so I should be the leader or I'm the best batsman in the team, so I should be the leader. And I think there's a danger attached to that, you know. Um, um, leadership is a learned skill and requires um, an enormous amount of self-discovery 
and growth to be able to become a, learn, a good leader. Um, leadership by instruction is not leadership because basically it's, I know more than you do and I'm going to tell you what to do. Um, we are measured by the results, we're measured by the numbers. Um, you know, as a coach, I'm measured by the win-lose column. You know, and I, I think one of the biggest challenges that we have as leaders is how do we behave through the results? And, you know, when we're winning, do we feel, um, you know, that, uh, that we're doing a good job? When we're losing, do we feel we're doing a bad job? Um, um, and then matching up risk into that um, is always an interesting one for me. Are you prepared to take a risk to make a significant difference to the environment, but at the same time, accept that it might fail. And then how many times do you allow yourself and the people around you to fail before you can achieve success? So I've come across many leaders who, um, who want to crisis manage, where failure is not acceptable, where one mistake is not acceptable, and they'll move on to the next best thing. Uh, and that, you know, that person fails and they move on to the next best thing because they're not prepared to stick it out through the difficult times. And for me, one of the absolute pieces of gold in leadership is to understand how much you allow an environment to fail before it becomes successful. Well, I can tell you something. When someone comes up to me as a leader and says, hey, Gary, I'm going to give you some constructive feedback now. I'm already putting my defenses up because I know I know something's, something critical is coming. Um, and I think it's an incredible skill to deliver feedback in such a way um, where it challenges the, the person you're giving the feedback to. But at the same time, it allows um, for a two-way conversation around. And um, um, I'm very mindful um, that when I, when I feel I need to deliver feedback as a leader, um, that I'm, I'm driving the, three, the feedback through a value system, not through the results. So I'm interested in my people behaving appropriately and behaving according to our strategic values. I'm going to deliver feedback to that. If, if they have made an error um, in their performance, um, very carefully, I'm going to um, deliver that feedback in such a way that the person walks away from it feeling they can still make a contribution and add value to this team, but they have to accept the fact that um, they've got to continue their learning journey or continue their improvement in their skills. You know, I think some people handle um, criticism or feedback a lot easier than others. Um, um, to give an example, I was quite a vulnerable player. You know, um, I needed people to back me, not to criticize me. Um, when people criticize me, I actually almost went into my shell and it made it worse, didn't make it better when I knew that my leader wasn't backing me. But if a, if a leader was backing me um, and I knew that they genuinely thought I was the best, you know, for the team and then delivered some feedback about how I could improve, I've got no issue with that. So I think, I think the skill sits in how you deliver the information. You know, you're not going to be performing at your best all the time and, um, and for a number of different reasons. You could have personal issues, you could have a, a loss in confidence, um, you could have an environment or a circumstance which trips you up and I think there's a lot of reasons why there will be obstacles in the way of your, of your journey, you know, um, whether it's in sport or, or whether it's a, a working journey. I think there's always going to be obstacles. and. Um, you know, for me, the best way to overcome those obstacles, especially in the context of a team environment, is to know that it's okay. It's to know that, you know, we still back you here. And we still think you're the best person for the job. And I think that often, the fact, I think that often solves all the problems. Um, and maybe an opportunity just to share the frustration. You know, I'm battling with something because I don't understand it and I'm feeling rushed or I'm running out of time or um, my confidence is down. And, and I think in, in, in the kind of world of measurement that we live in, 
sometimes it is really difficult to be able to share. And from a leadership perspective, to really understand your, your people, what they're going through. Um, and as I said earlier, to understand them as human beings, you know. Um, um, I'll never forget in um, 2009, we were playing a series against England. And um, Rahul Dravid was battling with his form. Um, and we weren't, you know, this is a legend of the game and MS and I were not sure, um, you know, how, how to deal with whether he should be playing or not. So we asked him, you know, we just said, you know, you know, your, your form is not at, at the best. Do you think you should, you, you're good to play the next test or not? Um, and often, often when given that opportunity, if there's, a, if there's security in the relationship, the player will, will be really honest around it and, you know, you know, Rahul could have said, you know, you're right, I think I am battling. I just wait till the next series. I'm just not feeling up for it. Um, he, he he made the decision. He said, listen, I think I can offer something in the next test match um, and you should pick me. And we did pick him and he got 100. Yeah, I think it's a real challenge for leaders now. Um, because they are under pressure to deliver results, but they also got to understand that they are um, trying to create um, the healthiest work environments that they can create. And sometimes the two don't match up, you know. Um, if you need to be flexi flexible as a leader around giving, um, you know, some of your employees the opportunity to work from home, for example, it doesn't necessarily match up because it's a single parent and they've got young kids at home, you know. So I think, um, I think leaders that are open to being flexible um, around their environments, but still creating an environment which has a strong value system. Ultimately, there's one simple um, thing that I stand by, and it's I've got to create environments where people are going to enjoy themselves and have the time of their lives. They must work, must not be a chore for them.